Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to this town hall, which is being co-hosted by the uh, Perinatal Neonatal Quality Improvement Network and the Betsy Lehman Center for Patient Safety. I'm Barbara Fain. I'm the executive director of the Betsy Lehman Center, which some of you uh, may know is a non-regulatory Massachusetts state agency that does research and convening on a variety of patient safety issues. We're delighted uh, to partner with PINQUIN on what we expect will be the first uh, in a series of virtual forums for, for sharing valuable, timely information about COVID-19 in the context of pregnancy care. Uh, we're gonna start off with a series of rapid fire presentations on key emerging issues, and those are gonna be followed uh, by an open question and comment uh, period where we're really um, hoping to engage uh, as many of you as possible so at this point, uh, let me uh, turn this over to Ron Iverson, who, uh, along with Audra Meadows, uh, co-chairs the, um, the Massachusetts Perinatal Quality Collaborative. So over to you, Ron. Good. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ron Iverson. I'm a general OBGYN at the Boston Medical Center, and I'm co-chair with Audra Meadows of the uh, Mass Perinatal Quality uh, Collaborative, part of the Pinquin uh, Perinatal Quality Collaborative uh, here in Massachusetts. And so I just want to uh, thank you very much for calling in and, and zooming in to be with us today. I want to thank the Betsy Lehman Center. Uh, we've worked uh, very closely with uh, the Betsy Lehman Center around um, organizing data for the state and uh, working on getting that to all of you out in the hospitals. That's been put on hold so that we can deal with this. And um, I think this project will also be really helpful uh, for all the different sites who are providing care to uh, women and babies uh, throughout the state. And I hope that you are, who are uh, dialing in from outside the state also are able to benefit. So uh, I want to thank all the presenters. Uh, people stepped right up uh, to present information to us and help us uh, think about COVID-19 and how to take care of our patients and our uh, staff and they've been very quick to um, uh, get slide sets together, uh, all in an effort to help each other throughout the state, and that's really wonderful. Thank you for calling in, and thank you uh, for all the work people are doing who aren't able to call in. We will be recording this, and we hope that this is able to help them as well. I think the best analogy I heard for this, from this, I don't even remember who said it, that this tsunami that we know is out there, we're standing at the edge of the ocean in the dark, and we know it's coming, we all know that here in Massachusetts, we're about to feel this for the next few weeks. And I really think that the work that people have been doing is going to help us do uh, better work, care for each other, care for our patients uh, as we come into this next month of work. So I'm interested to hear everybody's input, uh, both what we present and then uh, what's generated in the question and answer section right after. We are a quality improvement um, uh, group. And so we think that uh, this is really an important time for us to uh, really use the good habits um, and practices that we work on all the time as we develop and implement a uh, process to take care of our patients and keep ourselves safe uh, throughout uh, our care uh, coordination. So the presentations are organized in a fairly linear fashion. Uh, with an opening uh, with education around COVID-19 and the up-to-date uh, 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 presentation. Uh, then we're going to move on to different areas of care, so prenatal, talk about work that's done in labor and delivery in the operating rooms, um, and then into postpar postpartum, and then finally with some uh, thoughts about just leadership and how to uh, uh, develop and implement process well. Our goal is to suggest a problem, um, discuss the way that we approach that problem, and then also the final project. I think some people will walk away with, wow, that's an interesting way to approach that problem uh, and, how you, and how you dealt with that, how you did that. And then some people will really appreciate the final products and we're all excited to share with each other throughout the state what we're developing and we'll talk more about that at the end, how we can do that, both with the Betsy Lehman site and with the Pinquin site. Our goal here, of course, is not just to um, do things on a wing and a prayer, but to have planned improvement and change, even in rapid cycle, uh, as we're doing. So our goal is that we um, come out with good process, 
that we're able to talk about how we communicate that, how it's implemented, and how it's sustained throughout uh, this crisis. Um, again, we're going to provide opportunity at the end to uh, share what we're doing in our own spaces and for all the people who are presenting to share uh, with us what they're presenting here. So without further ado, I'd like to move into the um, conversation by uh, Hadi Doof and by Alana Goldfarb, uh, who are going to speak to us about pregnancy and COVID-19 and medical updates. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here. This is Ilona Goldfarb and jump right into the problem. So you could, perfect. Uh, given the physiologic, respiratory, and immunologic changes in pregnancy, pregnant women are particularly vulnerable to complications from viral respiratory illness. An example that's still fresh in our minds is the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, where we saw that pregnant women were more likely than non-pregnant people to experience pneumonia, hospitalizations, mechanical ventilation, and, and even much higher mortality. But the impact of the COVID-19 um, disease at this point on pregnancy is still uncertain. Our overall data on pregnancy is really limited so far to just very few case series that were summarized in, in one meta-analysis so far with 41 patients. So when we're talking about comparing pregnant women to non-pregnant women, we have to really be honest with ourselves and say that the sample of pregnant women is, is very, very small so far. So comparing this tiny sample to the general population data out of China, it appears that pregnant women present with similar disease manifestations as others. So fever, cough, and dyspnea. You guys might be seeing these patients in your emergency rooms already or on labor and delivery. And it appears from this very early comparison that the rate of ICU care and mechanical ventilation are similar between this small sample of pregnant women and, and the general population. But please note that there's so much about this disease process in pregnancy that we still do not know. In particular, we have no data yet about the prevalence of this disease in a general pregnant population or the manifestations of mild to moderate disease and how that differs from the general population. Next slide. Similarly, data about pregnancy outcomes are very, very limited as well. So here, our data is limited not only by small numbers, but also by a significant ascertainment bias, because all of these available reports of pregnancy outcomes are based on pregnant women who presented with moderate to severe illness. And more than 90% of these women that are described here had pneumonia. So what pregnancy outcomes would look like in asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic pregnant women is unknown. We also don't know what the outcomes will look like for women who were infected early in pregnancy and then recovered. But when we look at this table together, I want to draw your eyes to the high cesarean delivery rate that was reported. As you can see up on the top line, it's not 92%. We really don't know whether these were for maternal or fetal indications. And it's important to realize that the best mode of delivery for any pregnant women, woman with COVID-19 is still uncertain. However, it's, I think it's reasonable for us to imagine that stable women, uh, even though they were COVID-19 positive, would be appropriate candidates for vaginal birth. So we definitely don't want to take this data and uh, and summarize that all women with COVID-19 would, would need to be delivered in this way. Similarly, um, increased preterm deliveries were reported. However, we're not sure what proportion were due to spontaneous preterm birth or perhaps iatrogenic preterm birth given the mother's condition. Finally, the last line, please note that in all 41 cases from this meta-analysis, there were no reports of vertical transmission. While this is definitely still an open question, uh, we need a lot more data. The limited data so far regarding vertical transmission is reassuring.
Thank you, Ilona. Um, so uh, my name is Hadi Juf, and I'm an OBGYN at Brigham and Women's Hospital with the training in infectious disease. As Ilona has presented, the need for better data and larger numbers um, has been identified early uh, among providers, clinicians, and researchers. So our approach in Boston has been that of collaboration at the institutional level, citywide, nationwide, and even globally. And it was clear that this collaboration would be necessary to increase our knowledge fast, um, our knowledge about COVID and pregnancy. So uh, this slide basically highlights all the collaborative efforts that have been ongoing. Um, and I will start at the institutional level, even though citywide we were very quick at collaborating with the various other institutions. So at the institutional level, which is actually a recent effort, we at the Brigham initiated an OB COVID resource group composed of OB clinicians with a special interest in the disease or with training in infectious disease. Um, it is also a multidisciplinary group because not only do we have OB clinicians within the group, we also have an ID physician and um, nurses and an effort recently to include OB anesthesia and other people um, in the ICU who might be dealing with pregnant women. Um, and the main goal of this multidisciplinary group is to keep up with the literature organize clinical management guidelines and provide additional support to clinicians within the hospital um, who have COVID related questions um, about pregnancy um, via the use of a virtual pager. Um, at the Boston wide level, various hospitals, including the BI, BMC, uh, uh, the Brigham, MGH, and Tufts quickly decided to create a consortium of clinicians and researchers to study COVID-19 in pregnancy. So at some time in um, late February, uh, we uh, earlier, so in early March, we created a group through Slack, um, which is an app that some of you might be familiar with, and there'll be more details on the next slide, where we share up-to-date data on how we're managing patients. Um, this is um, at the at the institutional uh, in our respective institutions, um, and we also discuss which re research efforts we're leading at our respective institutions. So on this slide, on this site, are posted treatment protocols, um, not only specific to pregnancy, but also with um, specific questions related to pregnancy. We've also posted research protocols that we various institutions have submitted to their IRB with a conscious effort to align our protocols, um, as well as um, uh, research efforts um, that would use EHR systems like EPIC to gather data on epidemiology and clinical outcomes. Um, and it has become clear very quickly that we've all tried to uh, look at the same pregnancy variables in our patients who are either COVID uh, positive or COVID PUIs, just so we can um, unify our research efforts to be able to answer the same questions. Um, I will show it on the next slide, and, but we also have this biorepository of samples from pregnant women. And this is for all, um, all the institutions that I've mentioned have tried to um, create a protocol that is similar to, start, to get the same types of samples from pregnant women, including um, cord blood placenta, et cetera. Um, at the national level, there is uh, the creation of a national pregnancy registry through UCSF. Um, and this is a pregnancy registry that uh, collaborators in Boston have been an active part of. Um, and we're making efforts to um, ask uh, and inform our COVID positive patients and COVID PUIs to go on the website and sign up. Um, and last but not least, um, there's a global research consortium looking at COVID and pregnancy in various parts of the world. Um, and recently we started a chat group with um, other African researchers who are interested in COVID and pregnancy. Um, Dr. Adeline Boatin um, at MGH is leading that last effort. 
Um, so on this next slide um, is just really to show you what our uh, Slack platform looks like. You can see there's um, different subtitles on by repository. That's where is posted our protocol on um, detailed protocol on how to collect samples from pregnant women. Uh, we have um, one on clinical management. That's where treatment guidelines for various hospitals are posted at. And the global, um, you can also see global um, uh, guidelines as well as um, what the most recent literature on COVID and pregnancy is. Um, on this slide, I'm just showing the UCSF Pregnancy Registry. This is um, a website where you could direct your patient to, to sign up to be followed. Uh, throughout their pregnancy and the goal of this national registry is also to look at uh, pregnancy outcomes um, at the nationwide level. So looking into the future, we hope to obtain data on the natural history of COVID disease in pregnancy, specifically pregnancy outcomes and viral dynamics through the use of a biorepository. I think a few issues that have come up um, are that um, you know, number one, how do we include pregnant women in treatment protocols? Um, because the current treatment protocols that we have, both with hydroxychloroquine um, and remdesivir, um, have not specifically been studied in pregnant women, and the tr neither of the trials are looking at pregnant women. I think for hydroxychloroquine, we have a lot of data from using plaquenil in lupus, et cetera, and so there's some comfort in, in being able to use that drug. For remdesivir, Gilead has allowed for it to be, um, uh, for us to be able to um, give it to our patient through a compassionate use protocol. But again, pregnant women are excluded from the trial itself. Um, the second important question is how do we ensure good research collaboration? Um, and it's become clear that the way to do it is to try to avoid silos, to share protocols and, and sharing um, electronic health records like EPIC is very helpful in being able to pull all our data together to, to get um, answers to this um, issue of COVID in pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alona and Hadi. Um, the next presentation is on prenatal care. Dr. David Cantor from University of Massachusetts is going to speak to us about a process they've been working on to improve blood pressure monitoring in the prenatal period. So, you know, I, I had heard that uh, we were concerned on how we were going to manage uh, everyone's blood pressure, whether someone had chronic hypertension or not. And so I had wanted to look a little bit more into what our process was for blood pressure management. And actually, that's a, that's a good thing because we were able to, as we went through this, realize some of the, uh, some of the strengths and some of the, the weaknesses of, of what we have gotten so far. So if you could go to the next slide. <clears throat> So again, you know, the, the, the general problem is that now that um, there is this COVID uh, pandemic, the recommendation is to decrease the number of office visits, increase the number of telehealth visits, but that could potentially take two paths. You know, one path is that that combination leads to now a decrease in blood pressure monitoring, or uh, with appropriate implementation, it could potentially lead to maybe no decrease in blood pressure monitoring. And I think I'll, I'll be able to touch upon uh, what paths we've taken that could potentially fork down uh, both of those different roads. So if you go to the next slide. So when first we were looking into, you know, like how to manage uh, ambulatory blood pressure, you know, we, we looked at some of the, to see if anything had come out with, with ACOG. And the only thing that we had seen uh, recently uh, addressed by ACOG was, was what you can see here, you know, sort of advocating ambulatory blood pressure man management, but it really was just addressing it in the, uh, in the postpartum uh, and really didn't mention anything at all about what to do antepartum. And so we have come up with, uh, I, I would say, a solution, but again, as the slide mentions, it really is a work in, in progress. Uh, right now. And so for now, it seems as though we have sort of um, two uh, similar but a little bit different paths in how we are tackling this. We have a, a generalist group, which is uh, 
trying to order uh, blood pressure cuffs for all of their patients. And then we have the MFMs who cover the MFM office and the high-risk pregnancy clinics and diabetes clinics, and, and they are trying to do uh, their different implementation of uh, blood pressure management. And again, one of the, I think, the weaknesses that I, I've seen so far, but one of the strengths that was mentioned in just the, the last presentation is that people really need to work together. And even in the same institution, as you can see, having two different paths working to the same goal probably doesn't work out that well. But one of the things that we have tried to figure out in, in terms of, of trying to get these prescriptions done is potentially for women who are at low risk for hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, just maybe not even ordering any blood pressure cuff at all. Um, and then uh, ramping things up uh, when the risk increases. So for women who we see in our diabetes clinic uh, or women with multiples or a history of preeclampsia, uh, we will then you know, write a prescription for a blood pressure cuff and try and flag that indication to the prescription. And then we also ask them you know, if they happen to already have a blood pressure cuff at home, if they have a family member who they live with who has a blood pressure cuff and just sort of you know, low-hanging fruit ways of, of getting a blood pressure cuff to use. Also, um, you know, we are working currently with our Office of uh, Philanthropy just to see if uh, they have any means of uh, donating blood pressure cuffs to people who need it. So, you know, lots of people now are contacting our office, uh, our philanthropy office, to donate medical supplies like N95 masks and things like that. But one of the things that we can also have the philanthropy office uh, donate. Uh, or at least give money to would be blood pressure cuffs for our patients. And then, uh, like ultimately, if, if every avenue fails, then the, the probably the, the last resort would be an over-the-counter purchase by the patient uh, anywhere from $15, $20 to, to $25. So if you can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, this is uh, clearly a work in progress because as we work, work more into it, we realize the, the limitations. And you know, writing a prescription and clicking send is only one very, very small part of an implementation process. Um, so you know, there are many different reasons why a patient may not get a, a, a may not get a device. Um, one of the things that we learned pretty uh, pretty early this morning is that you can't just write a prescription and have someone go off to like a CVS and get a blood pressure cuff pretty much no matter what the insurance is. You know, lots of times these have to go through a durable medical equipment supplier and uh, not all insurances will cover the cost of the cuff. So that is one of the things that we are working uh, with our back office on and trying to figure out which insurances uh, will cover and which insurances will not. And then, you know, another reason someone might not get the device is that you may go through all the, the mechanisms perfectly, but they just may never pick up the device. So that is also something else that we need to uh, work on as well. And then, you know, again, um, lastly, there, there needs to be a process whereby uh, the, the data is reviewed in a, in a regular manner. Um, and then also understanding when uh, telehealth has its uh, limitations and your, uh, your goal of as much sort of um, social distancing monitoring uh, just doesn't, doesn't work out. So uh, I think one more slide. Yeah, and that's it. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kanner. Um, that was really helpful. It, it is uh, impressive how many barriers there are uh, to being able to continue to monitor blood pressure just in a routine fashion for our patients of high risk. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up. Uh, it does pose a lot of questions for all of us to think about how effective we are, and, and I appreciate you bringing that all to the table. Our next presentation is by uh, Dr. Uh, Andrew Healy over at the uh, University of Massachusetts School of Medicine in Bay State. 
He will be talking about uh, labor floor management issues uh, in uh, COVID-19 patients. Thank you. So good, a good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, this is by no means a basic science presentation, but rather a presentation from the boots on the ground uh, on the labor floor. Next slide, please. So the problem we are trying to address is the close proximity of the obstetric nurse with the laboring patient. Our nurses tend to be very close to the patient during the second stage of labor, as I am sure is the case at, case at most facilities. Um, one of the nurse's arms is typically behind the patient's head, and the second arm is either holding a leg or a thigh, um, supporting her while she's pushing. In our new world of COVID-19, we believe there needs to be a change to this standard practice. Um, we think about the potential for increased risk for transmission of the virus in our known positive patients or our PUIs, and also our asymptomatic patients who may not have even been tested. So what can we do differently in this new world to maintain the health of our team members in addition to the standard PPE recommendations? Now, as a result, we are attempting to define mechanisms to foster social distancing during the second stage between the nurse and the patient, what we have renamed as labor distancing. Um, to accomplish this, we assembled a team of experienced nurses and they were kind enough to let me participate as well. We went into a labor room, looked at the equipment we have, and then we, we brainstormed. Next slide, please. So this is what we have come up with to date. And, and some of this is from the SMFM recommendations, but we still need to figure out how to operationalize it in our own facility. And this is literally hot off the press at Bay State. So other than simulating it a couple of times, we have not rolled it out as of yet. I'm sure things will change, but, you know, but the important lesson here is that we identified a problem, we got people together to try and solve it. Um, and again, this is something I'm sure will change or be modified as we move forward. So the techniques to promote separation in the labor room are things like the patient wearing a mask if she's clinically able to do so, using a clear drape, and the word drape is in quotation marks here because we kind of had to make our own up, um, using a clear drape suspended across the patient's chest, a squatting bar for support of both the patient's upper body and lower body, um, stirrups or foot rests to support legs during pushing, and then lastly, just moving the computer that our nurse uses for charting further away from the patient. Next slide. So this picture shows one of our labor beds with some of the different features, including the foot rests and squatting bar in place. And the only clear drapes we have at our institution are for C-sections, and we only have a limited supply of this. So we had to think out of the box. We turned to these bags that are utilized as covers for our baby warmers, and we, we turned these into clear drapes. And this involved just cutting them and suspending them between IV poles. Next slide. These are some pictures of one of our OB nurses here. And you know, she is in pretty common laboring positions. The first position she's using for support um, for, of her legs. The, the second picture, she's using the squat bar along with the sheet uh, for traction and counter traction. And the third picture, she's resting on her side. These are labor positions that most of our nurses are familiar with, but perhaps not in this specific context. They're typically employed, as you know, to facilitate pushing or rotation of the fetal head. However, one can see that a patient needs far less assistance than what our labor and delivery nurses are often providing, um, being in close proximity to the patient. So no additional PPE is required for these practices. Um, we've made some videos of these different techniques, which we plan to share with our nurses for education purposes. And like I said previously, I'm confident there's going to be changes going forward. 
but it's a, a good place for us to start. Next slide. And just thank you to all the nurses who, uh, who uh, helped with this. That's really great. Thank you very much for uh, letting us uh, uh, see where you guys are in this process. I know all the institutions are struggling with how to uh, help the patients uh, have a wonderful experience uh, with delivery as best as they can in this time and to keep our staff safe and avoid uh, you know, overuse of PPE and all the other, all the other concerns. So thank you very much for sharing. I, I'm sure that uh, like everything, this will continue to evolve. Next up is Dr. Uh, Scott Schenker, who is at the Beth Israel Hospital, and he's going to speak to us about um, communication during cesarean deliveries on labor and delivery, and particularly around how, how they communicate that and how they get that out to their staff. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Ron. Um, I just want to start by saying uh, thank you to Pinkwin and um, the Betsy Lehman uh, Center for hosting this important meeting, and hopefully we all learn from each other. Um, next slide. Great. So um, I'm sure similar to, to most other units, um, BI has created a dedicated COVID OR, uh, and now we have two dedicated COVID ORs um, for uh, COVID positive and PUI patients. And um, uh, in doing so, we have not only leaned equipment, um, but have also um, leaned personnel. And so the, the, minimal, the minimum number of essential nurses and physicians um, are in the room, but that has created problems around communicating what's going on in the OR, OR to the rest of the unit and getting additional equipment that may have been lean for a standard case, but needed for an unexpected PPH or uh, an anesthesia complication that um, has come about. Um, so issues around uh, communicating um, between the ORs, and then I'm sure similar to all of you, protocols are being updated uh, hourly, um, and how do we disseminate that information to our 60 plus uh, uh, physicians with OBGYN privileges uh, or OB privileges and um, over 100 labor and delivery nurses. Um, next slide. So our solution, next slide. Um, so first we worked with um, very closely with our, our anesthesia folks in their quality improvement um, group and uh, created this labor and delivery uh, huddle sheet. And so before any COVID-19 cesarean delivery, um, all players in the team meet together either virtually in some actually in the same room, practicing social distancing, um, to review uh, everything from transporting the patient, PPE, um, how to transport uh, or transfer the neonate from the delivery room to um, a COVID resuscitation room, which has been created. Um, and uh, you can see on this checklist, which we're happy to share with anyone, um, uh, what we've done. In the issue around communication, um, we addressed that by really identifying a team leader. And um, that team leader was often, uh, we found best to be uh, one of the nurses who would have been an extra set of hands in the OR. So in our, in our first COVID OR, uh, our dedicated room, it, that room has a large ante room bef uh, uh, leading into the room. And so we call that, we labeled that, that team leader an anti nurse. And so the anti-nurse has a way of communicating via, via headset that she's wearing and that the primary nurse is wearing um, to communicate the needs of what's going on in the operating room to the rest of the unit. Uh, next slide. Great, so here are these headsets. We've got them on Amazon, I think. Um, they were not that expensive. We now have another set on, on the way now that we're using another OR. Um, and we've also found actually using these so what's going on in the delivery room for your PUI can be communicated to a NICU team that's waiting for the baby to be delivered has also been quite helpful. Um, next slide. So here is a picture of uh, our anti-room uh, nurse. She's always, uh, you can see she's labeled as team leader and you can see she's wearing that headset. So the other, the other uh, headset the primary nurse has on in the OR to address um, to address the issue of disseminating information um, other than inundating everyone's emails, what we've done is we actually um, uh, 
use Zoom, similar to this platform, to create a virtual simulation. And um, next slide. And uh, this is a picture of transferring the baby to the o, to the, the NICU team. Sorry, next slide. So here is that um, here is that video, and uh, um, we'll show it. And we've made them for uh, other scenarios as well. But it does highlight uh, the ability of these new platforms that we're all learning about to be utilized to utilize them to disseminate information. Thank you for joining us for a virtual simulation of moving a COVID-19 patient or PUI from a labor and delivery room to an operating room. I will be serving as the primary obstetrician. I will be serving as the primary nurse. I'll be serving as the attending anesthesiologist. And here we go. Hey guys, look. We already have signage on the fire doors between LDR four and five. It's really great that we can keep these doors closed. I think that pre-op huddle went really well. Yeah, I agree. It's always helpful getting the entire team together. OB, anesthesia, NICU, surgical techs, and nursing. I also think that assigning a team leader is always a good idea. I found that having the anteroom nurse serve as the team leader is quite helpful. That has been my experience as well. The three of us, me as the primary nurse, the primary surgeon, and the anesthesiologist will bring the patient back to the OR. Let's get prepared to move this COVID positive patient to the OR. As we review during the huddle, the three of us need to don our PPE, including hats, N95s, gloves, gowns, surgical boots, and face shield. John, don't forget to double gloves. You can take your top gloves off and still be protected. Thanks for reminding me. Janet, can you remind me who will hold the doors when we leave the room. Also, don't forget the patient needs to wear a mask when leaving the room and headed into the OR. We've assigned Ashley as the anteroom nurse. She and I will both have headsets on so can communicate throughout the case. Additionally, I can call out to the unit coordinator from the OR for any other needs. If any of us need anything that is not in the room, I can ask Ashley to call out to the front desk and have someone deliver it to the anteroom. Let's move the patient to the OR. Ashley will open the doors for us. Wow, look at ORC. We really have leaned out the OR. Yes, we have been quite thoughtful in removing unnecessary equipment. But remember, if there's any, something that we need, I can call out to Ashley and it can be brought to us. I can also call out to the unit coordinator from the OR for anything else. Let's move the patient to the bed so that I can place a spine on. Janet, while Scott and I stand with the patient, do you want to strip the bed? Okay, great, thanks. Just confirming, I put the linens in the linen cart in the OR, correct? Yes. Let me pass along the doc bed to Ashley so she can ensure swift cleaning and remaking of the bed so it's ready for transport out of the OR. John, now that the spinal is in and the patient is prepped, I'm going to doff my gown and gloves in the OR, meet my attending, anesthesia, my, my attending surgical assist in the anteroom. We will scrub, gown, and glove in the anteroom. During our timeout, let's remember to call the NICU team early so that they can get all their equipment ready. Okay, let's call them right after the surgical timeout. Okay, Ashley, the baby is about to be delivered. The surgeons will place a plastic clip on the baby side of the cord and cut the cord. We will not be performing delayed cord clamping. I will bring the baby to the door, Ashley will open the door, and the NICU nurse will be waiting for us in the anteroom. The NICU nurse will take the baby to triage eight for evaluation and resuscitation if needed. Now that the fascia is closed, my surgical, assist, my surgical assist should leave the OR. She should doff boots, gloves, and gown in the OR. Janet, can you please observe her doffing? Yeah, it's really important that we have a buddy while doffing so we can ensure we're not contaminating ourselves. Let's get her back to the bed and to her room. Janet and I will transport her to the room. Ashley will continue to open doors for us. Let's make sure the patient is leaving the OR with her mask on. Janet and I will doff after bringing the patient back to her room. Scott, we don't need you. Uh, you should doff while in the OR. The surgical tech can observe you. Make sure to perform hand hygiene after doffing. That sounds great. The tech can call out when she is ready to doff so we can provide her a buddy as well. Great case, guys. Thank you for all your teamwork and collegiality. Yes, thanks. That really did take a team effort. Janet, can you remind me where to find a copy of the algorithms and flow sheets for COVID patients? Of course, all the OB-specific documents are located in the PPGD as well as on the COVID portal. 
There are also a bunch of other very helpful resources on the COVID portal that are worth looking at. Thanks, Janet. I will talk to you guys soon when we debrief the case. Thanks again for everything. So, you know, that is uh, one of a few videos that we've used Zoom for to disseminate this information. The other way we've addressed communication is, you know, for the first uh, four or five, we wanted to debrief them and make sure that uh, the huddle sheet did not need to be um, uh, edited at all. And so we actually used Zoom for debriefing as well, which worked incredibly well. Um, and I think it's just another kind of innovative way to, uh, to utilize this technology we're all learning about. So I think that's my last slide um, and uh, happy to take questions later. Scott uh, and team, thank you so much for sharing that. You know, uh, lessons on kind communication, taking care of each other and the patient well, uh, new uses of Zoom, an excellent demonstration of a sim, just a lot of great stuff in there. And I'm sure that uh, it will continue to evolve uh, over the next few weeks. So thank you so much for presenting that. Uh, our next presenter is actually also from Beth Israel. This is uh, Dr. Chloe Zara. And she's gonna to speak to us about postpartum care of women during the COVID-19 pandemic. Chloe, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so thank you again, as Scott said, to Pinkwin and the Betsy Lehman Center for hosting us and allowing us to share the work of a lot of folks um, in our institution right now. Take the next slide. So um, postpartum care currently, and the, the, this is the, the problem statement, so that we have markedly reduced the number of in-person prenatal visits. Early hospital discharge has become the norm for routine deliveries, and the majority of our postpartum visits are now be, being conducted via telemedicine, either over the phone or via video platforms. So there are several um, problems that are facing us sort of in this new era. The first is that there are fewer opportunities for anticipatory guidance. There's less time to establish breastfeeding in, with in-hospital support. And there's the social isolation that's really facing all of us. We also have unique concerns for people who are identified as a PUI or are in fact COVID positive. Next slide. So we have um, tried to come up with a number of solutions that um, are addressing kind of this lack of information and um, I'll kind of talk through some of those. The first is that the staff in all of our ambulatory clinics have been doing active outreach. So this is primarily being done by nurse practitioners, nurses, and the residents actually, our, our residents who are not patient facing in the hospital right now are managing their practice. Um, we've also taken our childbirth education online and um, have had a MD available to answer additional COVID related questions weekly. As of yesterday, we started hosting online doc office hours daily to allow patients to sort of ask one off COVID related questions. Our parent support groups um, have gone virtual as ha and they've really focused a lot on one-to-one -one mentoring. We have a program I'll talk about in a second. And then finally, we've um, kind of used a strategy that we actually had hoped to investigate for routine postpartum care before all of this started, which is really nurse-driven um, care coordination for patients who have COVID-19 or are um, under investigation. So next slide. Next slide. Let's see. Okay, there's a slide showing our online childbirth education. Um, virtual office hours. So this was the Zoom platform we hosted starting yesterday. Um, apologies for my lack of poker face on video there. Um, but we allowed patients to dial in and anonymously ask questions related to COVID. Um, we had uh, double digits numbers of attendees the first time. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, 
our Parent Connection Support Group is a program that's been in existence for many years, um, but it has moved to Zoom. So thus far in talking with our social worker who coordinates that program, that's been a really successful way for people to connect remotely. Um, and um, again, people are also using one-on-one -on -one connections. And I'll take the next slide. And finally, um, this sort of ambulatory COVID team. Again, I really wanted to feature this because um, it's a, a use case for nurse care coordination, which is a strategy that we were hoping to pilot for high risk postpartum patients before the pandemic started. So we're including all ambulatory patients in this team who have symptoms, exposures, or confirmed COVID positive. And we've had a census of about patients on a day-to-day -day basis. As of last Friday, we had discharged 60 patients from surveillance um, after at least one week of phone calls. The strategy is daily outrun, out, uh, nurse run outreach and it is staffed by maternal fetal medicine attendings. We do a daily team huddle via Zoom. We do have the ability to see patients in person for ambulatory evaluations if they're safe enough to be evaluated in ambulatory fashion. We've developed a process for patient rooming, for um, having sufficient PPE for providers. We also have the ability to draw labs and safely conduct ultrasounds. And then finally, like um, Dr. Schenker mentioned, we've actually tried to be a little bit innovative about how we disseminate the information about this. So for context, our, um, our hospital is the delivery site for several community-based um, uh, ambulatory OB clinics. And so we have a number of providers coming from all over all over the city. We really wanted to make sure that people had a central location that we could provide um, coordinated care to these patients for who are at high risk. So I'll show you the video, hopefully. COVID-19 surveillance team. Hi, Carolyn, it's Scott Schenker, how are you? I'm good, Scott, how are you? Good, thanks. I have a patient who I think needs to be followed by the surveillance team. She's a 27-year-old G2P1 at 31 weeks with fever and cough for a day. Okay. Did you review the severity of illness? I did. I reviewed the following questions with her, and she has negative answer for all of them. Oh, good. Does she have any comorbidities? She does not. I reviewed the following comorbidities with her, and she's negative for these as well. Great. You should email the surveillance team with her name, her medical record number, and any pertinent information. Can you just confirm that this is the proper email to send that information to? Yes, what you have on the screen is correct. And so what are the next steps? So we will reach out to her in the next 24 hours. The surveillance team will follow her daily for seven days to check on her symptoms. If she develops a positive severity of illness, we'll arrange an in-person evaluation. If her severity of illness remains negative after the seven days, we'll discharge her from the surveillance team and email you as the referring provider. That sounds great. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Oh, you're welcome. Take care. All right, bye now. Bye-bye. So I think that there are several issues that um, remain to be addressed, even though we have uh, this high-risk pregnancy team. Um, one is how do you, for everyone, operationalize formal screenings that need to happen at the postpartum visit that are actually better done anonymously but in person, such as um, depression screening. I would also add intimate partner violence screening, substance disorder screening. So we haven't yet figured out a way to um, utilize ER to remotely push that out, but I think that's something that we would hope um, in future PDSA cycles we're to implement. Um, postpartum contraception, I think the conversation has changed slightly around postpartum contraception. I personally, as a provider, value the ability to um, kind of offer LARC methods and have people make a last minute decision about that in an in-person visit. And unfortunately, that's not the reality with telemedicine. Um, lactation support is a challenge. And finally, um, how do we make sure that this is equitable, that all of these new technological solutions to delivering care are distributed in a way such that people with language barriers are able to equitably access um, services and that people with, um, who have housing instability, who don't have internet access, who don't have a phone that's reliable, can also um, act 
access all of these services. So and I would love to hear from participants about any other ideas that they've had that success with. And that's my last slide, I think. Chloe, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, really great points. Um, a lot of complicated uh, issues for the postpartum area, and we appreciate you bringing them out, out there. And I know everybody's working on all these topics as well. Uh, so our next presentation is by uh, Mimi Pomerlu and Karen uh, Manganaro, who are nurses at the uh, Brigham Women's Hospital. And uh, they're going to just talk a bit about uh, using process uh, improvement in uh, solving problems every day. So uh, that's the best way to describe it. So thank you so much, Karen and Mimi, for presenting now. Thank you. We'll try to um, be quick. So we've seen that so many uh, decision making that used to take typically weeks or months went through endless committees is now made with a single conference call with fewer people weighing in and certainly much less data to guide us. The key is finding the right balance between getting the work done without losing sight of our original goal. The IHI model for improvement can still be used, albeit at warp speeds of rapid cycle improvement. To begin with, we certainly have to focus on what is it we're trying to do? Save quality patient care, maintain our commitment to family-centered care and normal birth, which is hard in these times, and to minimize that exposure to patients and staff. The specific aims that we looked at focused on communication of those changes and the realization that we needed to preserve a healthy work environment and workforce. From these rapid cycle responses, there's lessons learned. One, um, as seen in many of the improvement projects, is the lack of measurement data. When we looked at this and applied the quality improvement model, we could definitely see that that was a limitation. We're quickly making those changes and not necessarily focusing on measurement. So looking at this group um, at, at this meeting as well to help us determine when this is all over, um, did we implement changes that made a difference? Next slide. I saw this infographic on Twitter from Christina Hahn, and I felt it was important to understand that we're all dealing with this novel pandemic and understand that everyone is different place along this trajectory. From the community response of stockpiling toilet paper to our units finding that all our supplies and sandy wipes and masks are missing. Um, perhaps guided by the experts from CDC and our professional organizations and each other here in the state, we all need to get to that growth zone, both personally and professionally. We don't know all the answers yet, but we're open to these rapid cycle changes. Next slide. As in any um, process improvement, we look at what are the challenges, what are the barriers? And the potential barriers that we see, we still need to provide care to women and newborns. We can't do our job from six feet from the patient or six feet from each other. We just don't have long enough arms. We are a touch field. We're, we're frontline. We do have limited stock of supplies. Who knew we'd need so much? We're dealing with the changing expert recommendations daily. It seems to this, nope, this is best. It's hard to instill trust to the frontline and send the message that we've got your back when we keep changing, particularly in PPE recommendations based on, do we have it? Can we clean it? All that. Um, we have rules and guidelines, um, but it has to make sense to what we do and to fit into our goal of best care for mothers and babies. And Karen's gonna take over and talk about some of the changes that we made. Hey everyone, um, next slide. One example of the quick practice change that we initiated to respond to the fast paced changes in preparation for the surge in the ICU census was to think about workforce changes to manage this. Um, it initially made sense to train our critical OB nurses to help out in the ICUs, but we quickly realized that when we started training them, though it seemed like a good idea at the time and a good intention, it wasn't a good match. Uh, we realized that there was a small critical care strength in our OB team and that it would be better served on our unit for both um, their skill set and, maintain, and maintaining adequate staffing. So to decrease exposure, we initially planned all of our COVID positive and PUI patients to remain in LND and negative pressure rooms. 
And again, it sounded like a good idea at the time, but we quickly realized that this was untenable and that we needed the rooms back and the staff back um, to prepare for an influx of patients. So we had to make the change to transfer these patients to our antenatal and postpartum units. Um, and as we can continue to implement these rapid changes, we are guided by our lessons learned. So making sure we have the right staff in place, the idea of nothing about me without me, including staff in any changes that we're in, um, considering, and then the idea of piloting these changes and debriefing afterwards. Uh, next slide. So with the unprecedented amount of necessary policy, policy and practice changes comes uh, email overload. So realizing the importance of making sure that the correct information and timely updates are reaching all necessary staff. Uh, we have implemented a system-wide and institution-wide COVID emails. And then on the, for unit-based information, we have a COVID-19 binder that includes the what, where, and how. And that's updated daily with policy and practice changes. And then also by providing increased leadership, by staggering their hours to increase their presence, and then also unit-based um, daily updates. And lessons learned here, um, just the understanding that fear interferes with hearing the message. And we can feel that we can somewhat eliminate that by making sure that everyone's getting the right information. Next slide. And then practice changes aimed at reducing community exposure have included system-wide policy of no visitors with certain exceptions that include one OB support person. We've also had a separation of mom and baby with both our COVID positive patients as well as our PUI patients. We've minimized flow through our hospital stay on our delivery units, asking patients to remain in their rooms. And on the postpartum floors, we've minimized the use of the nursery and ask, again, asking moms and their support people to stay in their rooms. And so lessons learned here as we look at this, um, we realize that the patients need healthy support. We realize that we need to, con to continue to look at this, um, realizing that uh, the numbers of babies in our NICUs, in our well-born nurseries, um, we're gonna run out of space and considering whether this is in fact the right, the right thing for the patient. Next slide. So moving forward, um, just realizing the ine inevitability of the in the moment decision-making, we also understand that well, there will be unintended consequences that happen and may interfere with the goal. So to mitigate, mitigate some of this um, and keep us focused on our goals, and involve, we consider involving the front line with the process. So we've initiated weekly multidisciplinary conference calls to talk about the, our changes and any um, anticipated uh, problems. And then we also can't forget the patient, whether you call it shared decision-making or co-production, the patient is part of how we manage this. Um, so helping to make the experience better for them um, can add an added value perspective. And consider, we consider adding the patient as a part of the debrief to learn from them how the experience was and what we could have done differently. Thanks, Ron. That was great. Thank you so much. You know, emphasizing the daily learning and taking that into account, working with everyone who's actually on the front line, so important to always remember um, and know uh, and, and recognize the value of it. Um, thank you very much. It was just a really interesting presentation and, um, and I think it'll help a lot of us. So the next uh, presentation is going to be brief. It's going to be by uh, Dr. Munish Gupta, who is uh, a neonatologist at Beth Israel Hospital. He um, has been working with the NeoQuick uh, teams for a, a long time. And uh, we're going to have a, just a quick address uh, from them about uh, what's going on uh, in terms of data and any other updates from the neonatal teams. Thank you. Awesome. Much. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. And thanks, everyone, for great presentations. What a great turnout. This is just a minute. Um, so. Obviously, there's a ton of work going around about improving the care of these moms and making it safe and making it collaborative. 
We're doing some things on the newborn side. There's been a lot of informal conversations among many of the neonatal teams across the state already, which is terrific. We're trying to see what we can do it as a collaborative. Last week, we did a practice survey. About 30 centers completed it, kind of asking questions about how they're approaching newborn resuscitation in these situations, where newborns are receiving their care, what their approach to breastfeeding, testing of babies is. We'll have a report from that practice survey out shortly. Tomorrow, we are planning a, uh, a webinar for kind of the, the newborn teams, a little less formal than today's webinar. We'll kind of quickly go over some national guidelines and resources that are out there. We'll share the practice survey results, but then we really just want to have an open discussion where people can express challenges or questions and we can kind of discuss those as a group. And we are exploring some data collection ideas using a, a pretty simple common template that we'll make available to hospitals. This is gonna focus mostly on newborn stuff. If it works, it could be expanded into some maternal measures as well. As we heard earlier in the call, there are a number of other registries, kind of local and national that are much more detailed. We're trying to put together something that's relatively simple that many hospitals can use, at least to track these babies, if not get super detailed data on them. Great, if you just go to the next slide. So this is our webinar tomorrow. If, uh, if you have uh, neonatal colleagues that aren't on this call, that you wanna just give them a heads up about this webinar, we have sent out a couple emails about it, um, but it's tomorrow from 12P to 1P. The link is there, but anybody can email me as well and I'm happy to, to send the link. Thank you. Thank you, Mish. Okay, um, so that was that was really great, and thanks to all of the presenters. Um, a lot of information. Um, so I, we want to just, in the interest of time, quickly transition to the uh, to the open discussion portion of this program, um, and just a, a reminder. Um, send your chats with questions and comments if you haven't already. There are a number of really interesting uh, uh, questions already teed up in there. Um, and you can also at this point use the raised hand uh, feature uh, on Zoom if you, if you want to be called on to, uh, to, to speak. Um, but uh, I just ask you to remember to lower your hands uh, if uh, there's a question that, um, that if your question was already addressed by someone else, um, just in order to keep this going. And just a final reminder, and I know I probably don't really need to, to say this, but just uh, if you are uh, uh, speaking, just refrain from discussing specific uh, uh, patient cases in a way that could potentially identify anyone um, and don't name individual uh, clinicians or staff uh, either. So at this point, let me just turn, let me turn over to uh, Audra Meadows, um, who I know has been also monitoring the chat and, um, and uh, Audra, take it away. Great, terrific. We have over 200 participants. This has been terrific and we've gotten lots of questions in the chat. Three comments that came that I'm going to announce first include Dr. Lena Mittal's commentary that McPat for Moms is open and available for people who may need and for providers who want to utilize that service, especially specifically related to pregnancy and COVID. Ellen Tolan from the Massachusetts Breastfeeding Coalition also listed her website um, that there are supports and televisits available for women who need support around breastfeeding. And then Dr. Deborah Bingham, uh, founder of the Institute for Perinatal Quality Improvement, also commented that as we think about data collection and collecting information, that we also do that by race and ethnicity, because that'll be really important as we look at the outcomes of COVID related to uh, different populations. So with that, let's get started with some of the questions. Right now I have about 12 questions that had already started in the chat box. There are a number of them. Um, I'm going to start with one of them that came up now four times, just given that there are four, questions, four people had the same question, so I just wanted to toss it out there. And the question was, what is the general practice of your staff masking for PPE in the second stage? Are you using surgical masks or an N95? And then three others asked, are you using n 95 in the second stage of labor? So I'd love to, to push that question out towards uh, Dr. Andrew Healy and Dr. Schenker, Schenker excuse me. Um, to see what, what they're doing in their, their facilities around second stage of labor protection PPE. Hey, this is Andrew. So presently we're following, we're not using N95s. Um, we're following CDC guidelines, um, but things have changed rapidly here. So I don't know if that will be changing in the, the near future. At Beth Israel, we um, are using N95s in the second stage of labor. Uh, and for all cesarean deliveries. Terrific. Is there anyone else that wants to comment about what they're doing at their institution um, among our speaker panel? 
Hello, yeah. Michael or Hari. Is this just for COVID patients or for all deliveries? This question is related to second stage of labor for pay, for persons under um, persons of interest and COVID patients. Okay. Yeah, my 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 comment just to clarify, we are not recommending N95s for all patients. We are recommending N95s for COVIDs or PUIs in the second stage. This, uh, this is Karen. At BWH, we are using N95s for both COVID and PUI patients in second stage. Uh, the same at MGH as well. Terrific. Thanks for that input. And we'll also have some information that we will post on Penquin's website. That will be some resources and materials from this conversation as well as some resources and materials that are already posted there. And so there should be, there will be some commentary about PPE um, there as well. There are a couple papers that ACOG has recently published um, in the American Journal of OBGYN on the expert opinion of uh, use of PPE. Uh, the next question is, can community hospitals become part of the Boston-wide consortium? What if they do not have EPIC? If their contact person, is there a contact person for the consortium? This question is directed towards the first uh, speaker, uh, rapid fire speaker series with Dr. Deuce. So how do you, if you have an answer to that question, the question is, can community hospitals become part of the Boston-wide consortium and who is the contact person? Sure, so um, Iris at the BI um, is one of the MFMs there, also a researcher. She's the one who set up the, um, the Slack um, site and uh, would probably be, I think any of us are able to add you on. So I can give my contact information afterwards if anybody's interested. Um, and um, yeah, Chloe just responded, Iris Collier at the BI, um, who is the one I mentioned. So um, Iris is really coordinating all these efforts, especially with the biorepository protocol, et cetera. Um, and we're definitely inclusive um, and nobody who's been interested in being part of this has been turned away, especially in terms of sharing treatment protocols and having questions about clinical um, clinical management of patients um, and participating in, um, in, in, in research studies. I think the only uh, potential barrier that I see is that um, for Brigham and MGH, um, and the BI has done this um, par in parallel too, we've been able to have a, a partners-wide protocol. Um, and the partners-wide protocol for uh, the biorepository, uh, where we've been able to use the same pregnancy variables and uh, same samples that we're interested in um, um, in studying. Um, and so it will depend on whether your own IRB would approve um, uh, that too. And, you know, I think the fact that um, all these three hospitals, uh, in addition to BMC, actually have been able to move forward, um, whatever other hospital gets involved may, um, would be a little behind in terms of collecting that data, but certainly not impossible. And I would suggest reaching out to IRIS um, from that uh, biorepository standpoint. Um, but yes, what we are open to collaboration, as I mentioned. Terrific, thank you, Dr. Du. The next question reads, the question regarding the MGH institutional level, quote unquote, OB COVID resource group, who will be keeping up with the literature and organizing the clinical management guidelines for pregnancy and will these be made available to other institutions who may not have internal resources to develop similar expert cohorts? Um, I'd let uh, Ilona answer that question and also wanna add that, uh, or ask Ilona in your answer, can you comment on Anything that you'll be sharing from MGH that we can post on our Penquin website. Um, sure. Thank you so much uh, for the question. Uh, we we're happy to share any and all of our protocols on the website. And today I'll send um, the sort of simplest documents to look at, which is our pre-hospital triage flow sheet and also our labor and delivery protocol. It's really important to note that looking at these documents is intended to help others consider similar protocols for their own institution, but the, the details of each of these documents changes so frequently. We're updating these documents almost on a daily basis that it wouldn't be a great idea to just print them out and use them as they are. We even tell our own docs here at home not to print anything because it's essentially becomes outdated almost as soon as the printing dries. So um, it, I'll be happy to share our protocols, but with the caveat, then I'm sure everyone has the same caveat that everything we 
we share must be taken with a grain of salt and understood in the context of the day that it was published, which will be different the very next day. Um, I think the first question was around how to get access to um, the literature reviews. Is that right, Audra? Uh, just access to the OB COVID resource group so that assuming that there will be literature that you'll include in that um, resource group uh, I think the OB, OB COVID resource group was something internal that Hadi and her team at Brigham and Women's were using internally. So I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, yes, uh, this is Hadi. So yes, this is a group specific to the Brigham. And we, we are, as we speak, um, have divided up um, the various topics that we want to address about pregnancy and are working on um, putting together the document. And definitely it will be available. Um, first of all, it will be available on our uh, Brigham website um, in, under COVID protocols, may not be accessible to people on the outside, but we are happy to, we'll be happy to share it when, once it's um, full functioning, probably by the end of this week. Terrific, thank you. There was a question that also came in. I sent the person a personal a message. The question reads, are we anticipating aggravation of GHPEC in the COVID patient and or higher yield of abnormal testing or fetal surveillance for these patients? I just didn't know exactly what your GH and PEC meant. And so um, I didn't want to make any assumptions. So if you want to shoot, shoot me a note in the text box, um, just writing out what GH and PEC are, I'll come back to that question. The next They're referring question is, to gestational it, hypertension and preeclampsia. Oh, okay. Okay, great. I figured, um, but I wanted to make sure. Uh, do we want to spend time and answer that question then now? Um, sure. This, this is Ilona Goldfarb. Um, I, I think it's a superb question, and I, I have to be completely transparent and, and tell you that we don't know uh, because we don't really have a cohort of patients um, that are exposed in the first and second trimester that we know what the pregnancy outcomes will be. We really don't know what the best approach is to monitoring these patients either for growth or for preeclampsia. Um, so I think for now, uh, until more data is available, I think standard obstetrical indications for testing uh, should be employed for outpatients. Um, the second part of that question may be related to how do we manage inpatients with COVID positive disease. Uh, and that too, in a way, is almost on a case by case basis at this point, depending on how sick uh, the patient is, what her respiratory and hemodynamic status is, and what her gestational age is. Uh, we're making decisions around uh, fetal assessments based on maternal status. Can I just add that um, there is some overlap in the lab abnormalities, so which could confuse the picture. Um, so I 100% agree with Iona, but um, you know you can see elevated LFTs and LDH and thrombocytopenia with COVID, uh, and it may muddy the waters a little bit in making that evaluation for Hup syndrome. Dr. Easter, did you have any, any comments as well? may not be unmuted. Yeah, I think I'm uh, to the COVID, this is Hadi again, uh, uh, Sarah's note is that covidprotocols.org has um, protocols for COVID management um, and is available to everybody. I'm just saying. Oh, great. That's in the chat box, so the, the, link, the link for it. Perfect. Um, just speaking a little bit to the preeclampsia comment and follow-up, I, I do think that um, you know, keeping that in the differential, recognizing again, transaminitis is a prominent feature associated with poor prognosis in COVID positive patients. Um, and obviously any pregnant patient is at risk for um, kidney injury. I think, you know, one of the challenges is going to be sort of figuring out um, for patients who have worsening sort of end organ damage, you know, the question of delivery is one that is always raised. And I do worry um, for patients who present with sort of transaminitis or, you know, um, abnormal renal function, how we're going to sort out that dilemma. Um, and I think certainly it's something that other folks have been 
encountering in, in other states. Anecdotally, I've talked to two different people from the West Coast with two different cases questioning, you know, should we deliver this patient for renal failure? So, um, you know, the, the one thing I would say in that setting is this may be an area where, you know, putting on your med school hat and doing things like, you know, Athena to see if it's pre-renal or intrinsic kidney injury or sort of, you know, spinning their urine or relying on friends to try to help sort out the differential may be really helpful because certainly um, preeclampsia goes with other inflammatory conditions. And in that decision of someone who's sick because it's COVID versus someone who's sick because of preeclampsia, those are two really different management pathways. Um, so I think it's a great, whoever asked that question, I thought it was a really great one. Thank you. Dr. Easter, I appreciate that and everyone's responses. Um, the next question is, if the mother is positive, what is the current protocol for allowing partner support during her labor? There were a few that were mentioned. If people want to chime in a couple and just restate what their protocols are for partner support. Perhaps Dr. Healy, um, and Dr. Goldfarb, and just to think about just two different hospitals, how are you guys managing partnership support? And Mimi and Karen, maybe you can comment quickly on the Brigham. So this is Andrew Healy. So presently, we're not allowing any known COVID-19 patients or PUIs to have any visitors with them. People who are otherwise patients are allowed to have um, one person with them throughout the duration of their labor and postpartum stay. And that visitor gets questioned twice a day about whether they have any concerning symptoms for uh, COVID-19. Um, and they are not allowed to leave the room. If they leave the room, they uh, need to leave the hospital. Um, this is Ilona Goldfarb. At um, the partner's healthcare level, the, the visitor policy decision was that uh, patients that were COVID positive or PUIs were allowed to have one asymptomatic visitor and that that visitor needed to remain in mask and gown uh, and in the patient's room the entire time. Um, similarly, could not leave the room, could not, and once they were gone, they were, had to leave the hospital. This is Chloe from Beth Israel. We have the same policy. Yes, and as Alona mentioned, it is a partner, so the same at the Brigham. Terrific, thanks. So, let's, uh, noting that the time, we have nine minutes um, still in the, in the set presentation. Um, I'm on question five of, of 14 questions that I've noted. Um, so with that, there'll be a few questions that we won't get answered right away, but we'll, um, think about how to post some of the answers to some of the questions through a Q&A or an FAQ on our website. So the next question is, in regards to the presentation for base state, doulas are used, by, to, um, are used for utilizing a variety of different positions, or used to utilizing, sorry, different positions normally to um, not, adaptations, not adaptations of lying down. What are institutions doing to accommodate movement and labor during this time while maintaining necessary precautions? So as I stated during the presentation, we haven't implemented this yet. So, you know, those are great questions. And I think we're going to have to learn as we go. Our general approach is to let patients get in whatever position they want, provided it's safe for them and their baby. Um, and we hope to be able to continue that as much as possible. That's terrific. Uh, the next question says, to delay or not to delay cord clamping? Current thoughts. There were two questions on should we be delaying or not delaying cord clamping. Um, if Dr. Gupta um, would like to comment on that, uh, that'd be terrific. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think there's a clear answer. Like, we know that we don't think there's vertical transmission, as, as people commented. There are reports of babies having infection. Potentially, that's postnatal transmission. So it seems like contact with the infected mother that can be limited, that's probably safer. So the standard recommendations are you know, keeping the infant six feet away from mom, limiting contact as much as possible. So some centers have taken that to say, all right, let's not do delayed cord clamping, let's not do an initial skin to skin. Other centers have said, you know, it, it, that's still reasonable to do those things. So, so there's not clear science behind that. Thank you, Munish, appreciate that. 
The next yeah. question asks, are people re doing routine C-section in regular l and ORs versus the main OR? Um, that can be done with negative pressure. Also, where are people doing C-sections with intubated mothers in the main OR or l and ORs? I'm happy to answer that. So um, at, at Israel, we've created, uh, like I said, now two COVID ORs uh, on labor and delivery. What we've done to deal with the regular non-COVID volume is actually we've started to do some of our scheduled, uh, if not all of our scheduled cesarean deliveries, uh, which is about four a day, um, in the main operating room, uh, as their volume has certainly uh, dropped dramatically across the state. Uh, and that's allowed some nice, some nice collaboration between the main OR personnel and, and labor and delivery OR. Um, we have done uh, uh, a handful of intubated COVID um, deliveries uh, in one of those said ORs uh, on labor and delivery uh, following that huddle sheet that I showed and it, um, it went quite well. Thank you, Dr. Shanker. Let's go to the next question. Have hospitals, and also we wanted to comment from Brigham and Women's Hospital, we have a negative pressure of, uh, among our four l and ORs. One of them is negative pressure. Um, so we can perform procedures on l and if we need to, um, but may have a, um, protocols in place as volume increases to deliver um, in a different location. Um, have hospitals stopped using nitrous oxide even with patients that are not suspected um, or COVID positive? Maybe do you want to comment on that from Brigham and Women? Can we move on at BMC? Uh, the question is about have, has, have hospitals stopped using nitrous oxide even with patients that are not suspected or positive COVID? Yes, we have stopped using it at the Brigham. We have stopped using it at MGH as well. We Next question, thoughts? All right, Ron, did you want to comment on use at BMC? I think that was Andrew was saying, I think they've stopped, but we've stopped also. Next question is thoughts regarding closure of fan and seal, um, staple versus subcuticular in a COVID positive or PUI patient. We have not changed our recommendation for suture closure. Nor have we. Nor have we at Brigham Women. Same at MGH. Same at Bay State. We're moving pretty quickly. So with three minutes um, to 1.30, I'm gonna get through the, the next three questions with you guys. So the next question reads, with the early discharge, how are you managing newborn screening? Uh, another part of that question was, are you still doing the newborn screenings, um, CCHD, metabolic, and hearing newborn screening, and are these affected by early discharges? Um, Meg Parker's been responding um, on the chat box to those questions, but I was curious if we could unmute Meg and let her respond verbally. Meg is unmuted. Go ahead, Meg. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, um, we can. Yeah, so this is a, a fairly common thing hospitals are dealing with now. Um, generally, you really have to have the babies admitted at least 24 hours, and hospitals are just doing all the same newborn um, workflow processes we do. They're just doing them earlier before discharge. The one things I've heard is some hospitals are deferring the hearing screen if the babies are PUIs or COVID positive themselves because then it contaminates all the hearing screening equipment. But the newborn Thank screen as helpful. well can be done at 24 hours if you have to. And when they're doing that, are they taking them to the pediatrics office if they're leaving early than 24 hours for, let's say, an uncomplicated vaginal delivery who wanted to go home the same day? Yeah, so there's been the, the concern that I think most neonatologists and pediatricians have had at large is that with these early discharges, it's like a perfect storm. You're sending them home early and then pediatric clinics are substantially reduced their capacity right now. So we really worry that these babies are not being seen um, in the first week of life when many typical issues occur. Um, so we're worried about that. So that's just sort of something to know. Um, 
So if mm -hmm. you do decide to send them home early, I guess we'd strongly advise that you have a very clear follow-up visit in person, ideally, I think this counts as what we would consider an important in-person visit to check the weight and, and check feeding um, and that kind of thing in the first few days after discharge. I think that's terrific, that's helpful. Um, so a few of the questions were duplicate. So I'm down to the last question that I have um, that were in the chat box. If I've skipped one, please send a, a note into the chat box. It is 1.30, so I'll ask this question. We'll get an answer for this and then um, transition to Ron and Barbara for closing out. What is the process for transitioning from isolation PPE to sterile PPE? By donning and doffing in the OR, is there a risk of contaminating your scrubs that you need to remove over your head or face? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, we uh, don't have a great answer for that, to be brutally honest with you. So the um, you should keep your mask on at all times. Um, so that should at least uh, solve that solution or solve that issue. Uh, and I guess it would be difficult to take your scrub top off with your goggles, but theoretically possible. Um, the goal was to uh, leave the contaminant for the operating room, leave the contaminated PPE in the OR um, before going to the ante room in our case. Um, and you, but you do raise a point about um, the scrubs. And, uh, personally, in the three COVID deliveries that I've done, I just changed my scrubs after the case. Thank you, that's helpful. I wanna close out with two comments. Uh, one from Dr. Bingham, that says we also need to make sure that women are given a one save your life handout so they know about early warning signs and how to get care if any emergencies arise. And to add to Dr. Parker's commentary about newborn screenings, Dr. McAllman adds, in addition to early, with, in addition with early discharge, you may have more exposures for the infant by going into their pediatrician's office. And some highly recommend staying at least 24 hours um, and there may be billing issues um, by early discharge, this could be a problem. Um, with all that, I'd like to turn it back over to Barbara Fain and Ron Iverson to close out and say thank you to everyone. I really appreciate all your questions. If we missed one, please don't hesitate to send us a note um, to let me know and we can post some information and get back to you. Uh, Ron and Barbara. Great, so this is Barbara. Um, so um, I just uh, wanna thank all of the presenters, our partners at Kinquin, and all of you for a really robust uh, sharing of information today. We, we know your time is um, uh, is even more precious uh, than usual these days. So, so thanks for devoting the past hour and a half to this. Um, and to that end, to um, to help us plan future town halls, um, we'd we'd appreciate if you'd complete the survey that is uh, it's on the screen and it's it's also linked in the in the chat box. Um, if you register for today's session, we can uh, also will also be emailing you the survey link, survey link. If you didn't register and want to get an email, uh, send a chat now to um, to the Betsy Lehman Center um, at, with your email address, and we'll get it to you that way. So, um, without further ado, just uh, back to you, uh, back to you, Ron, to 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 close out. All right. Well, one last thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, been dialing in, zooming in. Um, thank you for sending your questions. Thank you so much to all the people who participated with presentations today and staying and answering questions. I just think this is so valuable and I really appreciate the collaboration we're able to do. And I look forward to doing this some more. Thank you so much. Please fill out the survey. We want to hear what you think.